So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Zoom webinar. Buonasera, benvenute e benvenuti. My name is Anna Maria Di Giorgio. I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in San Francisco, and I'm glad to be here today and open this new webinar to celebrate Dante Alighieri's 700th anniversary with four special guests, Valerio Capozzo, Ron Jenkins, Dennis Looney, Nicole Pagano. Thank you very, very much for being here with us uh, tonight. Uh, and as you know, Dante Alighieri, our Somo Poeta, died in Ravenna 700 years ago, and Italy and the Cultural and Diplomatic Network of the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs is celebrating Dante through numerous initiatives. So this webinar is one out of approximately 60 initiatives on Dante that our network has been presenting this year. Uh, when the epidemic struck, uh, together with my colleagues in North America, um, we try to find a way to put our resources together in a common effort to offer our public the best online cultural program possible, despite the difficult time we were all living in. And following the motto, la cultura non si ferma, culture uh, never stops. So it's very important for me to underline that this web series has been presented jointly by the Italian Cultural Institute of North America. So please let me thank my colleagues, Luca Di Vito, IAC Chicago, Valeria Rumori, IAC Los Angeles, Francesco Darelli, IIC Montreal, Fabio Finotti and Paolo Barlera, IIC New York, Veronica Manson, IIC Toronto, and Emanuele Amendola, IIC Washington. And a special thank goes to our embassy in Washington, DC, who patronized this web series. And last but not least, to our Consul General, Lorenzo Ortona, that is here with us today and would like to say a few words. Welcome, Lorenzo. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you, Anna, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it is a true pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, and this is uh, the second uh, big event on Dante that I have uh, to co-host uh, with you, Anna Maria. Uh, it is a very, very interesting and rich program. Uh, as you might recall, uh, last time, uh, we, Anna Maria organized a very nice conference uh, on um, Dante and, and art. Uh, and, and Botticelli in particular, uh, which I found particularly interesting. Um, and today uh, we, we find another uh, interesting point of view, um, an original point of view, which is uh, not reading it through the lens of art history, but this time um, really through, I would say, uh, the, the contemporary uh, um, vision uh, of Dante. So Dante out of the book from theaters to yes jails. Um, this is an, uh, an issue that um, we talked at length uh, with Anna Maria uh, a while ago. And I, I really find it a very, very interesting. And as we all know, uh, these incredible uh, writers and thinkers that we have in our history uh, are alive if we make them alive. And this is definitely uh, the kind of initiative that I think is important uh, from this point of view. Um, I want allow me to thank uh, first and foremost Valerio Capozzo, who is moderating uh, today's event. Um, the, the, how he uh, uh, has uh, um, exchanged with us and talked with us on the inspiration that Dante Alighieri gives to modern re readers in general to address their social condition and express their desire of freedom. Uh, is something very fascinating. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, by moderating it, he will give a very interesting input today. And allow me to thank, of course, Dennis Looney, uh, Ro Jenkins, and Nicole Pagano, um, who will discuss about uh, African-American writers' responses to the Divine Comedy. Um, I don't wanna take, uh, of course, uh, too, too much time from, uh, from the speakers. Uh, I just wanna underline one, um, Anna Maria, uh, has just said, and that is that it is uh, very exciting for us to be able, notwithstanding the pandemic, uh, to be part of an organization that has hosted more than 60 and is hosting more than 60 events on Dante in the United States. Um, so continue to follow, of course, not only us, but all the, uh, the diplomatic and consular uh, network of the United States. Um, there have been already very interesting talks, and I'm sure today's will be particularly interesting. I, I will be here to listen and I'm very excited about it. Um, so thank you, Anna Maria, uh, as always for this uh, outstanding uh, work and organization that you've done. And uh, I will leave the word to our speakers. Grazie e a presto. 
Thank you so much, Lorenzo. Thank you as always. Uh, and um, uh, coming back uh, to our webinar, Dante of the Book from African American uh, uh, Writers to Theaters in US Jails. We, as Lorenzo was saying, uh, together with Valerio Capozzo, decided to discuss a lot and decided to face Dante's work from an original point of view and a contemporary point of view, focusing on the inspiration Dante has given to modern readers to address their social conditions and express their desire for equality and freedom. So Dennis Looney, Ron Jenkins and Nicole Pagano will discuss African-American writers' responses uh, to the Divine Comedy in the 19th and 20th centuries and various theatrical interpretation of Dante's poem workshopped and presented in the American prison system. Tonight's moderator, Professor Valerio Capozzo. Valerio, once again, thank you very much for your amazing commitment. It's Associate Professor and Director of the Italian Program at the University of Mississippi, Co-Editor-in-Chief of Analisi Italianistica, member of the MLA Forum Executive Committee in Medieval and Renaissance Italian, member of the Executive Committee of the Comitato Nazionale Leonardo Sciascia, the Scientific Committee of Fondazione Giorgio Bassani, and Vice President of the American Boccaccio Association. With a specialization in literary criticism and material philology, he works primarily on the manuscript transmission of manuals for the interpretation of dreams during the Middle Ages, uh, with particular reference to Dante and early uh, Italian literature. His monograph, Dizionario dei Sogni nel Medioevo, Dictionary of Dreams in the Medieval Times, uh, has been published in 2018 uh, by Leo Oschi in Florence. So uh, before giving uh, our guests, uh, uh, before leaving our guests the floor, a quick note. Uh, at the end of the conference, uh, um, our guests will answer some questions we will receive. You can write the questions both in Italian or in English in uh, the Q&A in the chat below. Please don't write them, sorry, in the Q&A below. Please don't write these questions in the chat. Use Q&A, thank you so much. And now with no further ado, I'll give the floor to Valerio Capozzo. Thank you, Valerio. Thank you very, very much. I'm particularly grateful to the General Consul Lorenzo Ortone and to you, the Director of the Italian Cultural Institute of San Francisco, so Dottoressa Anna Maria Di Giorgio. You really made this event possible and grazie mille veramente <clears throat> to both of you. So greetings everyone from Oxford, Mississippi, where I am, the land of William Faulkner. You know, I can see his roof from my window here, so he's my neighbor. And so Faulkner, as we know, it, 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 it depicted the Deep South, where actually Dante has been known since long time, the 19th century, when the first African-American writers uh, begin to quote Dante as the paladin for justice and social equality. We were at the time of the Civil War, and so the fight against slavery, as we know. Today, um, Professor Dennis Looney will talk about many novels of African American that was inspired by the Divine Comedy. We are so in a, from 1864 to a 1985. I'm, I'm going fast here because Professor Looney will obviously points out all this kind of narrative. So the relationship between uh, these novels and Dante was overlooked so far. So today we have the, uh, let me say the opportunity to unveil these uh, surprising connection, as well as the use of Dante's work in teaching in US jails, as we shall see today. So on, on an official in the United States started to be read by important writers such as Herman Elville, Edgar Allan Poe, author, and they absorbed this poetic in their own novels. Longfellow, as we know, translated the Divine Comet in the United States in 1860. Since then, most North American universities offered and are, and are offering classes on Dante or the Italian Middle Ages and Renaissance. But today we would really like to focus our discussion on the dark side of the forest. So La Selva Oscura, so the forest of segregation and social struggles. Considering all the important studies and uh, analysis of Dante's works, works made by competent scholars here in the States or in Europe, 
uh, today would like to apply to the reading of the comedy, not the usual philology or literary criticism, but instead we would like to close the book and try to understand how and why African-American writers and U.S. jails inmates apply uh, Dante's guidance to their own life experience through a process of intimate writing, let's say. So today our special guest, so Dennis Looney, will talk about African-American reception of Dante's Divine Comedy. Nicole Pagan and Ron Jenkins will discuss their experiences of teaching Dante in prison where the Italian poet has become a guide for introspection and rewriting of the self. We honestly think that's a very in intriguing side of modern Dante nowadays. So let me introduce, it is my real pleasure to introduce Professor Dennis Looney, my good friend that I invited here at the University of Mississippi back in 2006. And that was an unforgettable moment for me, my students and colleagues. Uh, on his talk about the African-American reception in the Deep South. And we visited together at William Faulkner's house. So there was very good memories. So Professor Dennis Looney has served as director of the Office of Programs and director of the Association of Departments of Foreign Languages at the Modern Language Association. He taught Italian at the University of Pittsburgh. Publication includes Compromising the Classic, Romance Epic Narrative in Italian Renaissance. Most recently, he has edited and translated Ludovico Ariosto's Latin poetry. This is a 2018, if I'm not wrong. And but most importantly for us today is the book. This book that is the Freedom Readers. So the African-American reception of Dante Alighieri and the Divine Comedy published by Notre Dame University Press in 2011. So Dennis, we are very happy to have you here and we will be very excited to start our discussion with you too. Thank you very much, Dennis, for accepting our invitation. Thank, thank you, Valerio, and thanks to Ana Maria Di Giorgio and Lorenzo Ortona and all the staff at Instituto di Cultura di San Francisco. We ringrazio tutti quanti. I'm honored to be here. It's delightful to be here with Nicole Pagano and Ron Jenkins too. Um, I'm going to share my screen and expand it, I hope. Does that look okay? Let me get it going first. Hold on. It looks perfect. If you want to start the presentation, we will be perfect. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to show you an object and then talk about four writers as I move through this trajectory of Dante and African American culture. This is a strange place to start, but here I go. This is, you'll recognize the Statue of Liberty, but if you look more closely, you'll see that it's not the Statue of Liberty as you know it. It's a different version of the Statue of Liberty done in a cartoon, a political cartoon by Thomas Nast in 1881, published in Harper's Weekly, at a time when New Yorkers and Americans were raising money for the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty, which had been sent by France to the United States in celebration of the centennial of the US in 1876. So we had had it in this country for a couple of years. We were trying to raise money for the pedestal. Um, and if you look closely at the pedestal on the right, you'll see what Thomas Nast has inscribed on his version of the Statue of Liberty. But before I read that, let me get you to look at the left again. There she is, Lady Liberty. But instead of Lady Liberty, it's a skeleton. And instead of the torch of liberty, she's holding the torch upside down. And instead of the Declaration of Independence in her left hand, she's got the roll of death. There's something very wrong about the Statue of Liberty. And then on the pedestal, which New Yorkers are trying to raise money for, it says, New York, leave all hope ye that enter. Lasciate ogni speranza voi che entrate from Canto 3 of the Inferno, line 9. This is a clear signal that New York and that the United States is not a place to enter or that if you enter it, you're coming into a hell. This accompanies an editorial in Harper's Weekly that says immigrants to America in 1881 need to beware because it is not a healthy place. And they mean it literally and figuratively. 
if you come through Ellis Island, this is actually a couple of decades before Ellis Island, but if you come through the parts of the port that you have to come through as an immigrant, and these were mainly Irish immigrants, but Italian immigration was beginning to pick up in the 1880s and Eastern European immigration as well. And that would all pick up with great speed in the following decades. If you come in and you get quarantined or stuck in a spot, in a cage, as it were, you're likely to get very sick, it's unsanitary. But there was a further comment that they were making. And the streets in this country that you're coming to are not paved with gold. It's a hard place to be. They don't say it's a prison and they don't say in the editorial that it's a hell, but clearly the indication is that it's a hellish kind of utopia that you're coming to. There's a better view of the base Leave all hope ye that enter here. I just want to say about Thomas Nast, he was a, an Englishman. He was embedded in uh, Garibaldi's melee troops in the 1860s. He knew Italian culture very, very well and was very interested in Dante. And I think that's a topic that one could do more work on. Shifting gears and leaping forward. This is Ralph Ellison. We saw one version of his book Here's the first edition of his book, Invisible Man, published in 1952, in which Dante plays a huge role as Ellison critiques American segregated culture, which he compares to a hell, and in certain places he compares it to a prison. The very first non-American reference that Ellis makes, Ellison makes is this one. I not only entered the music, but descended like Dante into its depths. His character, his protagonist, who is never named, so is the invisible man, is listening to the music, the jazz of Louis Armstrong, and he's smoking marijuana, he's getting high, and he says, I went like Dante down into its depths. If you go into the archives at the Library of Congress for Ellison's works, you find all kinds of things that point to Dante. I mean, so they're, it's, it's a very deep and very impressive. This is one of many that I could pull. Um, this list on a three by five card of places, of categories, ice, fire, rot, labyrinth, maze, and then further down, exile, migration, lostness, submergence, silence. And then on the right column, crime, expiation, and then this interesting phrase, going to the end of, going to end of line. Ellison, in writing Invisible Man, thinks in a very Dantesque, Dante the Poet way, as he tries to organize and categorize the landscape of segregated America that his character is moving through. Once again, like Thomas Nast's cartoon of the Statue of Liberty, the word migration comes up. I should have read exile too, exile, migration. Migrating to America is complicated. Migrating from the South to the North, if you're an African-American in the 1920s and 30s, if you're participating in the Great Migration, so-called, is complicated. And then there's this other migration that um, African-Americans were subjected to, and that's the Middle Passage, the enforced migration being dragged from one continent to another continent that turns out to be not always a place with the streets paved with gold. Um, the novel, Invisible Man, is all about segregation in the 1950s, really, when Ellison is writing it, 40s and 50s. It's set in the 1930s, and his character, as he moves around Harlem, experiences it in ways that are very comparable to that of a prison. Um, 1965, Grove Press published The System of Dante's Hell, by a novel, it says, by Leroy Jones. And there's the image of Leroy Jones from the back of the novel. Leroy Jones um, is the man whose name then changes in the next year to Amiri Baraka. His son right now, Ross Baraka, is the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. Leroy Jones was obsessed with Dante. I think the fact that he published this novel, which is actually an autobiography or certainly an autobiographical novel of his time in segregated America, first in Newark, and then in uh, North Carolina and in Chicago and in, at Howard University in the 1940s and 1950s, as he's growing into his manhood, um, he depends on Dante. What he does is he turns to the schematic design that he finds in uh, Sinclair's translation of Dante, 
which is labeled in Sinclair's book, The System of Dante's Hell, which he uses for the title of his autobiographical novel. And you can see that uh, on the right-hand column, the breakdown of Dante's Inferno, as you know it, is then on the left-hand column, compared to the left-hand side, Baraka's organizational pattern for his own, the chapters of his novel. So his novel begins with a section on the neutrons and then on heathen, the heathen, and then the incontinent gluttony going on down and then into the end of the novel with some slight changes. And those of you who know the patterns well will see that he put heretics down at the very bottom of hell in his version. Leroy Jones or Amiri Baraka is very interested in the structural patterns or we could say the moral topography that he learns from Sinclair's translation of Dante. He adapts that structure to his description of the novel of his life and to his description of America. America for him is like the Inferno. In other parts of his writing, Baraka talks about, uh, organizes things in an analogous kind of way. So for example, in a play called Columbia Gym of the Ocean, he has a, a section where there are 10 categories, the drunks, the junkies, the prostitutes, the violent, the violent against each other, the pimps, the toms, the uncle toms, the hypnotized, the really hypnotized, and the hypnotizers. So Baraka keeps returning to this idea of circles of an infernal landscape, and he keeps returning to the notion of America is a hell. Um, in this note from the archives in the Schomburg Library, he writes about Dutchman. He's writing about He's, he's meditating on what he wants to say about um, the world that he's living in. And he, he's thinking about his famous play, Dutchman, where a character named Clay, who's a very upper middle class or middle class African-American on the subways in New York is murdered by a white woman. America is a hell run by devils. These devils walk among us. They tempt us and they will kill us. I'm just skipping down. They'll send us to Vietnam. They'll kill us if we let them. Um, and no more clays, uh, clay is a captive, clay is a victim. We don't want to have any more clays, no more clays. I'm at reading at the bottom. No more murder must be tolerated. Devil America must die. Um, he's very politicized in his response to the structures of racism, the systemic racism that he feels. He doesn't want to be involved in the NAACP. He's critical of all kinds of um, structures in the African-American uh, culture that are trying to respond to systemic racism or white supremacy, he wants it to be much more radical and radicalized and he's very frustrated. So that last line, white America must die, he cuts out white and says double America must die. Uh, this is my last author that you'll know, I have one more to come, uh, Gloria Naylor, who in, 18, in 1985 writes this novel that Valeria was very nice to hold up uh, Linden Hills, which is a fantastic novel, very well written, very well designed about um, social mobility among African Americans in the 1980s. And it looks at the development of this suburban neighborhood on the edges of the inner city um, called Linden Hills. It turns out that there is a school between the suburban neighborhood, Linden Hills, this African American development, and the ghetto. And in the school, on the school's doors, this same, uh, this place where I began, the gates of hell, the lines from Dante's Inferno, Canto Three, on the gates of hell um, are used for the school. And I'm just going to make sure I can see all this. Yeah. Um, these are the two characters, Willie and Lester. Lester is nicknamed Shit. They, Willie and Lester, walked along in front of the school and past the main entrance, there were three bronze plaques over the triple doors. I am the way out of the city of woe. I am the way to a prosperous people. I am the way from eternal sorrow. Chico and the Raiders had spray painted their insignia over the middle plaque, over the middle door. Sacred justice moved by architect. I was raised there by divine omnipotence, primordial love and ultimate intellect. You know shit, Willie said, looking up the last bronze plaque. Only the elements time cannot wear were made before me and before time I stand, abandon ignorance, ye who enter here. I could have done all right if I'd gone to school. These are the two characters from the urban inner, inner city, the ghetto, who go work over five days leading up to Christmas in the neighborhood of Linden Hills trying to make some money. 
uh, one is going to one is on his way to college. The other one drops out of high school. That's the one who's talking here, and they're passing in front of the school where they comment on one way being out, uh, one way out of the prison, or one way out of the hell is to get an education. The gates of hell are repurposed here as pedagogical. And I want to take you to one last figure. Edward Smythe or Smith Jones is spelled in two different ways. Born in 1881, 1968, an African American uh, from India, from from Mississippi, and then moved to Louisville. He was from the child of two slave, enslaved persons who were freed at the end of the Civil War. He then uh, grew up. He was born in 1881 in Mississippi from his parents. Then he went to Louisville. Then he went to Indianapolis, and from there he had this burning urge to get educated, and he went to. Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, to Harvard Yard to enroll in Harvard College. He publishes a book, The Sylvan Cabin, full of his poems. He hopped freight trains to Harvard College in Cambridge. And I'm quoting a book from 1923 that describes this. Arriving travel-worn, friendless, moneyless, hungry, he was preparing to bivouac on the campus his first night in the university city, when being misunderstood and not believed, he was apprehended and thrown into jail. He wrote a poem called Harvard Square, In the Jail. And in that poem, uh, a really spectacular vision comes to him. The muse comes and talks to him. And I'll just read the last stanza of this opening part of the poem. I plied my pen in sober use, in spin each moment spare, in sweet communion with the muse I met in Harvard Square. She's talking to him in the jail. And one thing she says to him is, I placed great Dante in exile. So implying you, Edward Smythe Jones, in jail in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a lot in common with Dante. The muse of inspirations come to his aid, comes to his aid with a brief lesson in literary history, comparing him to Dante. He is more, his banishment is not quite like Dante's, but he's a Negro, as he says, in the white man's world. He's a southerner in the north. He's a backwoodsman in the university city. He's a self-taught man among the hyper-educated. And he's a would-be Dante at the very center of Dante's American home. The African-American writers that I look at in the Freedom Readers use Dante to get out of their hell or to get out of the prison or the segregated world that they're trapped in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. Obviously, I'm fortunate we are virtual, so the round of applause that you deserve, we can all hear too, but we know that everyone is clapping at you. And let's go to California in this point, since we are actually in a way in California, but let me go there with a quotation, since you were talking about the, the Dante's quotation of the gate of hell in New York City. Let me quote this guy that actually was talking about the same driving to California. Here's the, here's the quotation. On the, on the California side, I would suggest a sign to read Ab and Ope, all ye who enter here, or however Dante said it. Well, it's behind me for a while, anyhow. This is William Faulkner when he came back from California, living back to Mississippi. So we are in two gates of hell, or United States on the West and East Coast. So let's go please to Nicole Pagano that I had the pleasure to meet in 2018 in Sorrento where we joined together a panel on teaching Dante outside of Italy. And, uh, and she uh, made this wonderful experiment, theatrical experiment to a rewriting, a personal rewriting of the Divine Comedy in the San Francisco County Jail. So Nicole Pagano has led classes on the Divine Comedy in various adult settings, including the San Francisco County Jail, Incarnation Monastery, and the School of Applied Theology. A native of the Washington DC area, she studied at Georgetown University and she earned a master's degree from the Graduate Theological Union in Art and Religion. Mrs. Pagano lives and works in Berkeley, California, where she currently serves as chief of staff to Nobel laureate Saul, Saul sorry, Perlmutter at the University of California. Okay, so Nicole, please, thank you so very much for accepting our invitation. And we are very excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. And good evening, everyone. As Valeria said, my name is Nicole Rose Pagano, and I am so excited for this event. 
uh, as the daughter of two Italian Americans who met while serving in the State Department and as the granddaughter of a man who immigrated here from a small island off the southwestern coast of Sardinia, it is with a great deal of joy and poignancy that I am with you here tonight. Uh, grazie infiniti per la vostra ospitalità, Consul General Ortona and Director Di Giorgio. Professor Capozzo, thank you for bringing me to this table, uh, meeting you and talking with you about the transformative elements of the Comedia is a delight and Professors Looney and Jenkins, uh, it is a real honor to share in this conversation with you on the creative potential that awaits a multitude of Dante's readers. It's hard for me to name any work of art that is that asks more of its readers than the comedy. And in doing so, it's hard to find a poet who believes more in their readers. Dante first startled me with his intensity and relentlessness in college. And by the time graduate school began, I was fascinated by his concept of an eloquent vernacular for the beauty, power, and authenticity he found in everyday speech. Given the fractures I was seeing in our world, I hope to instigate a common language with people and bring the comedy and its unifying possibilities into larger view. These efforts eventually formed a class called the Dante Experience. It serves adult communities seeking self-discovery, adventure, and transformation. And in these settings, I teach the divine comedy as a liberation text. And this approach comes from textual evidence. For throughout the over 14,000 lines of his epic poem, Dante tucks in 20 apostrophes to address the reader directly on their journey. These are the moments when the poet peeks through the wall of the narrative and lets the audience in on a little secret. And when these 20 puzzling and demanding asides are extracted from the poem and strung together, one can see Dante's formative aims for his readers laid bare. I'm just going to share with you a, a quick schematic that shows some of this um, progression. So within the asides are imperative verbs commanding the reader to do something specific. In Inferno, they tell us to think, to gaze, and to trust. In Purgatorio, they admonish us to sharpen our eyes to the truth, to think what follows, and to honor the bridle of art. The asides in Purgatorio advise us that we gaze, we raise our eyes with the poet, we feed ourselves, and we begin to imagine with him. Tracing the asides demonstrates the kind of relationship that Dante hopes to achieve with his readers. It communicates a path of learning and care, and one where the reader is first asked to think, assuming the role of a student apprentice, and gradually over the long arc of the poem, she is trained to imagine, evolving into a progressively individu individuated and creative agent. When I teach the Dante experience, the aside's trajectory from learning to creative agency animates the curriculum. And in the case of the San Francisco County Jail, the Dante experience supports a curriculum of nonviolence and accountability called Resolve to Stop the Violence Project, or RSVP. It has been counseling and educating male inmates for the past 20 years under the auspices of the nonprofit Community Works. So each day, these participants perform a version of cognitive-based group therapy that examines their cycle of violence based on perceived roles of male power. The program primes certain individuals for the critical thinking and creative imagining that Dante clamors to have with his readers. The goal of the class is to bring students into direct dialogue with the poem so students can offer considered responses to some of life's most enduring questions. How can the comedy help us examine our inner experience, the meaning of freedom, and what we believe to be a just world? What can we bring to the poem to engage our relationships in new and positive ways? And how can our studies help us become leaders and peacemakers in our community? Throughout the class, students develop capacities to address these questions by reading the poem privately. 
witnessing visual renderings of the poem, and writing weekly journal entries. They also share their work using a method of reading out loud practiced during the Middle Ages called Lexio Divina. Finally, if they choose, we produce a performance for the larger RSVP community based on their writings. Students in RSVP struggle with a unique set of challenges in the classroom, especially depression and hyperactivity and post-traumatic stress disorder. They spend four of their waking hours outside of their cells and no time indoor, outdoors. Participants can be reassigned to the general population for behavioral violations, and others will leave permanently for federal or state penitentiaries. So not every class goes to plan. Given the unpredictable nature of a jail, I find it helpful to give the class a firm footing from day one. I prepare the Dante experience by learning about the students prior to the first class. I distribute a questionnaire. I assess for learning styles, creative strengths, and their personal reasons for taking the class. And this first exchange offers a glimpse into their abilities and what is motivating them. So some pay attention to directions, other neg others neglect them, and some express authentic excitement for learning, while others show a certain type of reticence. You know, I gather all of these impressions to try to gauge the appropriate learning modalities and comprehension levels the group is working with. This questionnaire also begins our rapport, and this is very important. It remains constant through the course, and from the outset, the students see that I'm taking them into account. So in the first class, we learn about Dante, the poet and his times and the comedy. And right after this, we form a document to govern our classroom. It is approved by a consensus and it is signed. And when disturbances arise, the text serves as our common agreement. And because students age in, in a, vary in age and education, they make a commitment to help each other with comprehending the text. There are instances when adult men in the prison are not literate. They have somehow come through our educational system without the capacity to read. And these agreements build a learning environment that is based on mutual trust and responsibility. So they can promote that peer-to-peer -peer support. And those are all priorities of RSVP. So then we dig into the poem. We read the first three cantos of Inferno together out loud and in their entirety. And we look at art, works of art depicting the dark wood, the three beasts, Virgil, Beatrice, and Hell's Gate. And while we do, we talk about human responses that accompany trauma and loss. We look at the three beasts and the ancient conception of sin as incontinence, violence, and fraud. And at the end of each class, I assign writing prompts. I call them essential questions for exploration in their journals. We, the questions are tied to specific contos for personal reflection. We begin with, what is your dark wood? And then we move to which beast blocks your path and why? We ask, who would be your Virgil to guide you through your dark wood? And then we see about who is your Beatrice, that force of grace who sees the singular promise in you. Soon after I read their first entries, I ask for volunteers to share their work in class using a protocol based on Lexio Divina. This venerable practice of divine reading was common among medieval monastics. Lexio was traditionally used to discern the meaning of sacred texts and has four steps, where a group first reads a text out loud and then reflects on it. The listeners then speak the words that stir their spirits. And finally, the group shares a moment of contemplative silence together. In the Dante experience, the student's writings become the sacred text. A student offers to read his, his, his responses to an essential question. The class receives it in silence while meditating on the words that ring in their heart. The reader repeats his entry a second and possibly even a third time with students still listening attentively. And there's something about the quality of this attention that is so 
powerful and positive and uh, formative of a community. So after the short period of silence that follows that, the listeners share with the reader the words that have especially moved them. And for this work, I'm, the, I'm their scribe. I'm right at the chalkboard. As more words appear on, this, on the board, the reader can see how he has moved his classmates. And when the reflection concludes, an affirming collage of words shimmer with meaning for the entire group. Here's a rough simulation of what Alexio feels like and looks like. Um, this one is in response to the question about Beatrice, the one who sees a singular promise in you. We'll look at this in silence together. Students' entries on the first three cantos of Inferno on personal suffering, chosen guides, sources of transfiguring love, and overwhelming obstacles provide me with additional information for their learning. They help me chart a path through Inferno for them. I consider the plot, the contrapasso, and the essential questions each canto could evoke on topics that are relevant for them and their work in RSVP. Take the neutrals. Those souls that weren't really able to stand for much in life, they raise an interesting opportunity to write about personal commitments beyond oneself. For students struggling with addiction, Francesca's speech stands as an example of the intoxicating logic of a person who turns away from the wise book that could save her life. The goods committed to fortune in Canto 7 give rise to a conversation about integrity. Rather than living life at the edge Students note the practices they can count on to keep them centered at the hub of fortune's wheel. And Pierre de Lavinia being unjust to his just self in the woods of the suicides gives students a vital chance to explore how they are learning to say yes to life and no to the option of violating anyone, including themselves. At this point, the class takes a broader look at the importance of words. Specifically, we identify the qualities of eloquence that aim toward a greater good and counter the hopeless and evasive rhetoric of Pierre and Francesca. We look to modern voices like Langston Hughes and his poem, Mother to Son, in all of its beauty and love and encouragement. We listen to the speech by President Obama that he delivered to a grieving Boston, a, a grieving Boston after the bombings in 2013. Then we take in a radio broadcast from this beautiful couple who are remembering their son DJ, a man who loved being a cop and who died from injuries he sustained while pursuing the Boston bomber. We consider the realms of the tender relationships involved in each of these texts, from the personal to the national, and how an eloquent vernacular can act as a vital source of solace and direction especially in a world struggling with inequality, violence, and sorrow. Together, we declare the qualities of our own eloquent vernacular based on their assessments of these modern texts. You know, I still pull them out from time to time when I need a reminder of the good that words can actually bear. I'd like to share some of them with you now so you can have a sense of them too from the students themselves. An eloquent vernacular is thoughtfully constructed. It paints a picture. It includes, it inspires. It serves as a guide for suffering and calls on the spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. It seeks to unify rather than divide. It seeks to intimate rather than violate. It captivates yet frees the mind and allows us to search inwardly to find our peace to contribute. It hopes for a world of peace. These qualities of a shared vernacular become a touchstone to help students broach the fraudulent residence in Inferno's deepest realms, 
The writing assignments shift from dialoguing with the poem as a framework for their own experience to deploying their newfound language in their own vernacular to confront the entrenched predicaments of Ulysses and Ugolino. They write to them directly about their compromised roles as fathers, husbands, sons, and leaders, and how they can heal to do better for themselves, for their families, and for their citizens. In the beginning of Purgatorio, there's a touching moment when Virgil reaches his hand to gather the dew from the fresh green grass. He then cleanses Dante's face from the arduous trek through Inferno. In response to this tender moment of men caring for one another and really seeing each other, students are assigned the name of a classmate at random and respond to their final prompt. What strengths would you hold up for your friend? so they could see their own true colors, a question to support community and begin the climb of Mount Purgatory. These entries offer an opportune moment for students to acknowledge one another's goodness, knowing full well the trials they have shared since the dark wood. They are not necessarily writing about someone they know deeply. What they are asked to do is to observe their classmate for a week and take the note of the good that they see. These tributes are specific, funny, and even nurturing. Taken together, they compromise a beautiful reflection of the human spirit of just selves being just to one another, free from the grimes of the grime of Inferno's wake. And what was lost becomes radically new. After the last essential question and lexio, I asked students permission to compile a script that's based on the very best of their writings and we place them right alongside the poem and their essential questions. When everyone feels comfortable enough with that content, I have the scripts printed and bound. Professor Capozzo, thank you for still having it. It's amazing. <laughs> and our class transitions into rehearsals. We do physical warm-ups and vocal warm-ups. I mean, I, I have these guys dancing and they're not really, I, we, we just had such a wonderful time doing this. And we run the script with blocking and together we form a show. You know, the rehearsal process integrate what they've learned previously and they build new strengths like bravery and teamwork and a rooted sense of confidence. And on the day of the performance, we take our places in the open area between their cells and the deputy's control desk. I introduce our play and begin with an excerpt of the poem and RSVP facilitator follows with the related essential question. And it's hard for me to describe how moving this is, but one by one, each student rises to respond to the essential question and tell a story of his life through the framework of the divine comedy and the lessons of RSVP. As one speaks, the others share the stage, occasionally cheering each other on. Behind them, works by Joseph Sudek, Frank Wesley, Henri de Trucchetti, John Flaxman, Francesco Scaramuzza, William Blake, and even our very own NASA Hubble Space Telescope offer visual depictions of the comedy. The images back up the performers who have transformed the cries of their own dark wood into authentic and creative words of wisdom presented especially for the RSVP community. For a moment at the close of the show, tensions between the whole and the particular give way to another bold vernacular statement, unanimous and almost heavenly applause. Prison is an unconventional setting for a class on the comedy. But the poem is a call for all human beings to reconsider the moment of being alive and to say the words that can embody that moment with rigor and imagination. I see special potential for the divine comedy to respond to particular groups of people in their larger communities. These teachings can vary, the cantos can vary depending on the aims of any given class. And luckily for us, Dante gives us 100 canti to choose from. A curriculum crafted for inmates could be a very different journey than one crafted for veterans or executives or religious orders or Americans stunned by our current political straits. As much as our rugged Western individualism hates to admit it, we all find ourselves there looking up into the dark trees and no path in sight 
with no idea of what will come next. This is just the moment that Dante's extraordinary poem is waiting for. When we reach for his good book and open it with courage and hope, precisely when courage and hope seem to be in the shortest of supplies, then we can begin a unique adventure with Dante toward a wisdom rooted in love and justice and care for one another. The good of our words, our language as it is spoken today can speak to Dante's words as they were spoken then. And in the dance between then and now, between the old words, what the old words have to teach us about what is new, we can name what draws us together. And in doing so, draw ourselves to a new life, a new peace. Thank you very much, Nicole, especially for sharing with us your Dante experience from which I think all of us felt your love in Dante, in teaching. And I, while you were speaking, I was thinking of you as an Ulysses for your students going to virtute conoscenza, so virtues and knowledge of wisdom, or at least knowledge of the self. So thank you very much. So now from California, we are flying back to the East Coast, where finally we find our Ron Jenkins, that I want, I'm really happy to meet him virtually, but at least. And Ron Jenkins is professor of theater at Wesleyan University and frequent visiting professor of literature and religion at the Yale Divinity School's Institute of Sacred Music. A recipient of Guggenheim and Fulbright Fellowships, has facilitated theater workshops inspired by Dante in prisons in Italy, Indonesia, and the United States. An honorary fellow of the Dante Society of America, Jenkins has written, <coughs> I'm sorry, for the Yale ISM Review, the Jakarta Post, Quaderni di Teatro Carcere, and the New York Times, among obviously other many publications. His most recent book is Resurrezione dei Santi, Tragico Media Sacra e Benafro, published by Bulzoni in Rome in 2019. His writing of prison, issue, prison issues was supported by a residency at the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center. Please help me in welcoming Professor Jenkins. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you, Valerio. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Anna Maria and Lorenzo, the Italian Institute of Culture. Um, it's, uh, it's, and it's really a wonderful honor to be on the same panel with Dennis Looney and Nicole. Um, Dennis's book has inspired me uh, for many years because the men and women that I work with in prison are men and women of color as are most of the men and women in prison in the United States. Uh, and uh, Nicole, your, your presentation uh, resonated very deeply with me and reminded me of many of the experiences I've had in prison. Um, well, I, uh, I have taught in prisons in, uh, from Sing Sing in New York to uh, notorious uh, Krobokan prison in Indonesia to uh, the Siliciano prison in Florence, Dante's hometown. And when I uh, tell people that I work in prisons they, uh, with Dante, they, the immediate association is, well, of course, men and women in prison would identify with Dante because they live in a kind of hell. The, the physical landscape that they live in is, is, is hellish. But I find the deeper connection is not with the physical landscape of hell, but with the mental landscape that the men and women in prison share with Dante, who is in exile, who was convicted of crimes, who was isolated from his uh, family and is taking this journey through difficult times. And that mental landscape is what really connects the men and women in prison with, uh, with Dante. And uh, like, like Nicole, we, we read Dante, we, uh, the men and women listen, they read, they reimagine, they write their responses to Dante, and then we perform them at the end of our, of our sessions. Uh, sometimes I do this as a teacher inside the prison alone. And sometimes I do it with my students from Yale or from Wesleyan. Um, and the final performances, as Nicole said, are always very moving. Um, and I want to want you to try to imagine what it would be like for these men, uh, who I'll talk about mostly tonight, 
uh, standing in front of an audience. It's in a maximum security prison, men who are there for a long time, convicted of violent crimes with tattoos and uh, muscles and big tough guys in the audience. And then you're gonna to talk to them about Dante. It's not easy. And initially there's, there's always you know, a lot of uh, rustling and uh, uh, discomfort, but when they hear that Dante also was convicted of crimes, they start to pay attention. And by the end, there's always uh, a standing ovation. And in the discussions, there's lots of tears. These tough guys with tattoos are crying by the end because they really make a deep personal connection to Dante. And the performers who've been reading Dante uh, really bear their souls in an environment where it's not easy to bear your soul and an environment where people really um, will not pay attention if you're not telling the truth. So they're really telling the truth from their heart. And I'm gonna to read to you, imagine you're in this prison setting and a man with tattoos, this particular man, Patrick, was a hell's angel, lots of tattoos, tattoos, big, tough guy. And he introduces his writing with these words. He says, when I first began reading Dante, I found it a little challenging. But when I looked deeper, I saw Dante was actually writing about me. Dante begins Inferno with the line, I came to myself in the middle of the journey of our life. And he uses the word our as in all of our lives. It kind of hit me that the greatest prison is the prison of self. Then what struck me most was, well, facing myself. Here I am in a physical prison, but I tend to keep myself in a greater prison within my mind than this one of concrete and steel. When I read Dante writing about that, I realize I'm not alone. Someone else felt this way. Um, and then he would go on to tell a part of uh, some of his life story that connects with some of the events in Dante's journey. Um, and I, um, I wish you know, that, I, that I had the video so you could see these performers, but of course in prisons you can't really bring in audio video equipment. But one time we were very lucky that the administrators let us bring in audio recordings for a feature that was done on national public radio. And I'm gonna play for you the voices of the men themselves talking about Dante and uh, presenting fragments of the stories that they wrote inspired by Dante. So you can really hear their voices uh, because that, and uh, uh, Valerio is gonna play that for you now. Oh, wait, wait, before you start Valerio, um, <laughs> you'll first hear, this is a, a group uh, that worked with my Yale students at the McDougall Walker Prison in Connecticut. And you'll hear the Yale students singing Regina Chaley, which is one of the uh, chants that Dante hears in Par Paradise, uh, Paradiso number 23. Um, and the students are always backing up the, uh, the performers supporting them often music musically. So that's what you'll hear in the background of the Yale students singing these chants. My father left me at an early age, sending me in an early rage. Some of the reasons why I'm in this cage. And you telling me God knew all this? This was preordained? You mean this was staged? What, he's the author and I'm some character in this book and he's just turning the page? Sins of the father. When I was out in the world, I was so godless. About my crime, found guilty on all charges. I just hung my head low and my mother took it the hardest. And now I'm in prison hoping my young daughter don't get locked up. Cause she's looking for love in all the wrong places. Hell, daddy's not there. Daddy's locked up. Sins of the father. My son talking about he want a gang bang. He's a minor older guy's on the corner selling that cane. He hate cops now. Ch -ch -ch -pow! He want to carry that thing? Sins of the father. I only got myself to blame. My kid's mother I no longer see. She be like, oh, he's just a memory that used to mean so much to me. Living in drug infested areas. Kids clothes ripped and dirty. Face not nose. Cars not registered. Street full of potholes. My kids living a hard knock lifestyle. And you can see it in their eyes. Growing up on fast food restaurants, Chinese chicken and some McDonald's trick fries, sins of the father. Me and Dante can relate because hard experience in life, like bad troubles in my time that led me to a deeper 
tunnel and obstacle, just like he went through in the, in the, in the poem. And it made me realize that sometimes you got to look at the signs and try to change your way. Instead of fixing what you can't fix, just start up something new. And with that, I could relate with him. So it's like we know, I know exactly what he's going through at the time. So, Who is the guy that you chose to lead you? I chose Michael Max because um, he come from New York City just like I did. But it's just not where he came from. It's, it's life experience. He went to jail just like I'm in jail. And um, he told himself, you know what I'm saying, in jail, because he didn't have the proper guidance when he was home. So he had good brothers that was telling him what to do and how to do things in jail. And because of that, I, I can relate to him because I got older gentlemen that's teaching me in here how to educate myself. Did you ever make a connection between the things that Dante says and what's written on your neck? Yeah, you can't fix your past, you know what I'm saying? All you can do is play how it is, and that's what I got on my neck, and I believe in that quote. So it's like a poker game, you know. If you get a, a hand that's dealt to you and you know you got a, a bad hand, don't quick, don't be quick to fold it because they don't got nothing either. So play how it is, you know, take your chance. Sometimes you got to take chances. And what is it that's written on your neck? I'm not afraid of death. It's a stake that one puts up in order to play the game of life. Is this justice or is this just ice? Only one who has knowledge of self can serve justice. Just is the reward and ice is the penalty. When one is penalized, he or she is served with just ice, meaning to be frozen in a mental state of 32 degrees below zero. Is this justice or is this just us? Because of the color of my skin, I'm a usual suspect. My nice clothes and jewelry, a drug dealer is what some suggest. If I defend my haven or my home, gang violence is what they suspect. They lock us down for years and use us as test subjects. Is this justice or is it just ice? See, I live in a state of commonwealth where the rich get rich and the poor get poor, and everyone is for himself, where individuals get envious of your wealth, and you receive decades or centuries for trying to defend yourself. Is this justice or is it just us? It's just this. Society prepares the crime and the criminal commits the act. For me, justice is just I see equality, because I just see equality. The reason why Dante's story, uh, I tried to make parallels with it to my own, was because I associated the journey the overall journey uh, with the Inferno uh, uh, as my life experience, you know, with DOC, with uh, coming up in DCF in foster homes and boys' homes. And I, I saw a parallel in me going through some of what, somewhat of an Inferno myself. So with that and with my love for poetry, I thought that I could associate Dante's coming out of hell in his eventual... Uh, success and freedom with my putting an end to my uh, recidivism, my situations of hell, and finally having an ending that would be uh, more or less prophetic or victorious. So uh, that's basically how I, would, how I relate to Dante's Inferno. I can relate to Dante because with myself, uh, I have a lot of doubts. And I seen doubts in Dante. I had fears. I seen that in Dante. You know, many times I wanted to quit. Actually, I did quit. That's why I came to end up in prison. You know, many times Dante wanted to turn around and quit. And that's why I related to Dante. And then who was the guy that you chose? I chose Maya Angelou as my guy. A strong lady. Uh, I grew up around a bunch of women. I had 15 aunts and uncles in them, you know a lot of women and I just see she was strong and still she rised. That's why I chose her. And I remember when we did the performance uh, a while back and people were cheering and applauding you, 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 you told them to stop. What, what did you remember what you said that yeah, day? Um, <laughs> yeah, after the, the performance was over, I told them to stop because right now I'm still in prison and all what I say, I just don't want to be a prison promise maker. You know, so don't cheer for me. Cheer for me when I get out and I'll be a better father to my kids. And everything that I'm trying to do in prison, I really get out in the world and, can t and do it. Then applaud for me. But right now, I'm just another prison promise maker.
It's a photo of Jessica on her crowdfunding page. Okay. On her front. Um, so at the end there, you heard the um, uh, the the uh, passage from the Ulysses Canto, Fati non foste a vivere come brutti. You were not meant to live like beasts, but to follow virtue and knowledge. And that 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 story of Ulysses resonates very strongly with with the men, as does the story of Ugolino. Many of the men talk about their relationships to their children and how. Uh, one man in particular, they usually weave in lines from Dante's poem into their stories. And one of the lines that uh, one man used was, um, uh, uh, he, he remembered how Ugolino's children were starving in prison with him. And he uh, said, that reminded me of how my children were starving when I was in prison. They were not starving for food, they were starving for my love. Um, and he and so many of them said that their families do the time with them. Their families are serving the time, their families are suffering. And that's something that people don't always think about when they think about men and women in prison, that it's really, in a sense, the whole family uh, that's, uh, that's incarcerated in some sense. And one of the, uh, and when one of these men that you've heard, the, the last one who's said that he didn't want people to applaud for him until he got out and became a better father for his family, he uh, told a, a story about his mother. You actually heard his rap a little bit. He said that when at the beginning that uh, he was guilty of all charges, but his mother took it the hardest. When that was performed by the Yale students at Yale, because the men can't come out of prison to perform their work. So the Yale students perform the work at a, at a chapel in Yale, the Marquan Chapel. They that's when the family members can come and hear the stories of their sons and brothers and mothers because they can't come to the prison performance. And the discussions after that are always really emotional. I remember when he, uh, when the student performing those lines written by this man uh, got to that point where he said, my mother took it the hardest, I heard this kind of gasp. Uh, and I thought it was like a sound effect by one of the uh, one of the actors, but it was not. It was the woman, the mother herself in the audience crying when she heard that line. And she talked to the audience afterwards about how um, how she thought she had never heard him say those things about her, really moved her. And she said that studying Dante for him, his daughter had died while he was in prison. Well, he said, she said, studying Dante helped him get over the grief. She said it was the best therapy he had because the prison wasn't giving him any therapy. Dante gave him the therapy that he needed at that point. Um, but many stories like that, that family members hear things for the first time uh, performed by students performing the words that their family members had written. And there's you know, kind of a, an emotional reunion there. So the, um, the end, uh, you also heard them talk about their guides uh, as Nicole did in, in her uh, experiences, the guides that they choose, you know, their Virgils are Mother Teresa, Houdini, uh, Mike Tyson, Maya Angelou, uh, Joan of Arc, Moses, Malcolm X. But the guy that I remember always most is a guide that one of the men uh, called Future X. He said, Future X is my guide. And we asked him, what does that mean? He said, Future X is my future self, but the best person that I could possibly become when I get out of prison, that's gonna be my guide. Uh, and Dante inspired him to really, you know, think about transformation and redefining himself. So many of the men in prison, they don't wanna be remembered as only the worst thing that they ever did in their lives, which is what they got locked up for. They, they wanna become someone else and they're inspired that Dante, nobody even remembers Dante as a convict. They remember him as a great poet. And he, in a sense, redefined himself. He didn't let himself be defined by his uh, conviction. Um, and uh, one of the men who was actually born in prison, uh, extraordinary, his he was born when his mother was incarcerated. And now he is in prison in a sentence for 999 years. Um, so he expects to die in prison, but even he, uh, saw Dante as a story of transformation that he could emulate. And uh, 
as uh, trying to find his quote here, but he said something like, you don't have to die as that mugshot. You know, you are history being made. You don't have to die as that mugshot. You can become something else. And that's what Dante inspired him. One of the, to, to think about, one of the men actually that I worked with in Sing Sing back in 19, about in 2010, uh, 11 years ago, I stayed in touch with him and he used Dante, lines from Dante in his application for clemency. Uh, when he and his lawyer wrote their application for clemency, they, he talked about his experience reading Dante and he quoted the lines. And uh, here's, here's what he said. These are his words. His name is Dennis Woodbine. Uh, and he's visited my classes since then to talk about how much Dante meant to him. He said, I was tired of living in darkness, living in darkness, being in that hell. Um, like Dante, I knew I was going to have to face some demons, but I wanted to get to the light. Reflecting back on the workshop 10 years later, uh, Woodbine continues and says, talks about it in the past tense. It inspired me to continue writing poetry like Dante did. Dante talks about finding himself. Hell can be a physical place like prison or a state of mind. Your demons, your criminal lifestyle, that's hell too. If I didn't go to prison, I'd be dead. I needed to go into that darkness to get to the light. Um, and about his clemency application, he says, we opened the clemency application with a line from Dante. About halfway through the course of my pathetic life, I woke up. And here he's using a translation from a, a modern vernacular translation uh, but, uh, with illustrations by Sandow Burke. Um, and uh, he says, when I, when I say woke up, I mean that I started living up to my potential. The workshop sparked my life. It motivated me to come out of the darkness. 10 years ago, I was studying Dante's words and it was Dante's words in my clemency application that got me out of prison to where I am now. Um, uh, so it's, 10 years later, he's still remembering it as a, as a turning point. Um, another man who was actually in that class with him in Sing Sing uh, in 2010 also still remembers it as, as a turning point. And uh, happily, he's not in prison anymore and he's worked in my classes at Yale. And, it, and uh, at Wesleyan. And when he talks about Dante, he says, um, when Dante says that he woke up and became aware, I said to myself, wow, because that's just what I'm going through. Once we started the workshop on Inferno, I fell in love with it. We were diverse, Italian, Black, Dominican, Jamaican, Puerto Rican, listening to each other respond to Dante. We realized we were more similar than different. We were able to come out of our shells performing our intimate thoughts and feelings and being listened to without being judged was liberating for us. In prison, you're at rock bottom of your life, but you still hope you can climb out of it and get to some kind of paradise. The whole text of Dante goes to teach you that all life's journey is about self-realization and understanding who you are. That's the bottom line of Dante, the realization of yourself in the most perfect form of who you've always been but lost sight of. Reading and performing it gave me perspective on my own transformation and let me see that heaven, hell, and purgatory can exist in prison or out of prison or in your own mind. Um, and uh, he just so, was so deeply engaged in it that he, he identified with Dante's experiences in hell, in purgatory, in prison, when he was in prison and out of, out of prison. And when, um, so that, you know, that's just an example of the, the, the depth of the connections that, that people uh, can make with Dante behind bars. Um, I, I don't know how much time we have. Um, Valerio, maybe I can give one more example from the prison in- uh, Yeah, one more example, Italy. please. And okay. then we would like to answer some questions. Thank you. Right, okay, we wanna have time for that. So in Florence, the, um, the, the each, each class, chooses lines from Dante that are the theme for them. And in Florence, the theme was Deligate uh, Justidium Qui Judicatis Terum, from the, uh, the, the circle of heaven dedicated to justice. Um, that's, the, that's where Dante uses the Latin, respect justice, you who rule the world. 
or love justice, you who rule the world. And justice was a theme that recurred in all the prisons because justice is of course really relevant to them. And that when in Florence, when they performed the piece, they repeated that line over and over again using a gesture I don't know if you can see, it was a gesture, delegate justitium qui judicatis terum. It was almost, uh, and it was so forceful, it was like a judge's gavel, but at the same time, it was also like this frustration that had been built up over the years of having to submit to justice that was not justice, that was injustice, that it wasn't working. And there, there was a frustration that they could express when they listened to Dante rant and rave against the injustices of his time, they could, rant, they could identify with that and rant against the injustices of, of their time. So that um, you know, was one of the, uh, the many references to justice that made um, me and my students look at justice in a different way and look at Dante in a different way. That the, the relevance of Dante to modern times becomes clear when you look at it through the eyes of men and women in prison and you realize that, that the same injustices that Dante was fighting against are the injustices that plague our culture today. Thank you so very much, Ron, for everything you said, for your experience that you shared and the recording that you had us uh, the opportunity to listen to. And I think that was a great way to come closer to the moving and touching experience that you and Nicole had. Uh, we have some questions. I'm receiving many messages saying thank you very much and congratulating with you all. So that's very great. And now let's move to our contemporaneity. <laughs> let's go there. So let me read the first and second question together in a way. So a question to all of you. How can Dante address and help to resist the oppressive violence of the carceral space in the US beyond the personal responsibility and potential transformation of the individuals who are currently incarcerated. In other words, what is your vision and application of a radical Dante that then speaks about and engage against state violence? I want to answer. Um, well, I can, I can start on that. The, please, um, please. Uh, because we're, in addition to studying Dante this year, because it's the 50th anniversary of the Attica prison uprising, we're also looking at Attica. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, one what, what of the men who spoke at Attica 50, 50 years ago, um, and in, as he announced the demands and the manifesto of the men who had been mistreated so badly that they revolted inside the prison, one of the first, his speech started out with a, a line that was almost the same as Ulysses' speech in, uh, in Inferno. He said, we are men, we are not beasts. Uh, and then he went on to say, we need, you know, reading materials. He didn't say, he didn't quote exactly, we need virtue and knowledge, like Ulysses said, but he said that we need reading materials that are not censored. We need uh, religious freedom. Um, and, uh, and it was almost, it reminded me of what Mandelstam said, the poet Osset Mandelstam said about Dante's cantos, that they are missiles for the future, that some, somehow, in the future, 700 years later, later 650 years later, the uh, men in prison were not quoting Dante, but saying the same things that Dante said, that their, their, their words echoed Dante's words because his, you know, his, his poetry spoke so directly to their needs. And to the, um, when my students and the audiences that the general public sees these things written by men and women in prison responding to Dante, their impressions of what prison is change, you know, because most people who haven't had an experience in prison, they think, oh, that's where all the bad people are and that's it. They don't think about anything else. And that's why in prisons are tucked away and people don't realize that, you know, that there really are human beings in prison and situation needs to change. So we like to think that step by step by humanizing the men and women in prison through uh, publicizing their responses to Dante, that public opinion about people in prison can change. But if we go out of prison, let's say uh, we have um, a question from Colombia and uh, our 
Um, so thank you very much for such an interesting perspective. I'm from Colombia, I'm reading the, um, the, the question, obviously. And as you might know, we are currently going through some hellish circumstances. I heard the journalist saying how some scenes at the protest where cops are killing people are Dantesque. Mm -hmm. At this point, it seems like all we have is hell without the promise of heaven. And so the question, how to make sense of hell when hell seems all there is at the point in the context of political violence? Dennis, what do you think? Or, or Daniel, or Nicole? That, that, that's hard, but um, one way to think about uh, responding to the question, but also just the things that we've been talking about, you know, hell is infernal and, you know, prison can be infernal, but as these beautiful presentations by Nicole and Ron show us, there's hope. And even in the depths of hell, there is this moment, there's a, there's a ray of light, which commentators talk about as a kind of symbol of hope. Brave to Jodentro de la Muda, and Ugolino, there's a shaft of light that comes in that ought to give Ugolino a chance to see his children as they really are, but he doesn't. Mm -hmm. But aside from that commentator's passage that people talk about, I think the friendship, the bond, and I'm thinking now that both Nicole and Ron work this into their pedagogy, the choice of guide, you know, the friendship, the bond between Dante and Virgil, and actually, as Nicole pointed out, between Dante and the reader, um, that friendship is very hopeful. And so I, I would just say to the speaker from Colombia, and thank you so much for coming so far, uh, no matter how bad it seems, and you know, I, I hear it, I hear that it's bad, and it's bad in, in Palestine and Israel right now, and it's bad in the, it, it, you know, every day there's something else in the US. Um, there's a kind of potential for hopefulness in the bonds that you have with your guide and your guide can be a text, or your guide can be your mother, or your guide can be Maya Angelou, you know. And so hold on to that um, and look forward. The, you know, everybody has their favorite line of the Divine Comedy, and mine always changes, but um, I love the line, Come foglietti pur monate, the angels who come down in purgatory to put on a show. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a performance for the, per, for the, the pilgrim and his guide are dressed in vests or vestments are dressed in gowns of green. They're, the gowns are green and the green is the newest green of springtime. Like, like little leaves that are just now born. And that is so hopeful uh, mm -hmm. to me when I hear it and think about it. And so I would say to anyone, let's don't get bogged down in Inferno. And if the journalist says it's Dantesque, say, okay, but there's another side to the Dantesque journey and it's hopeful. Thank you, Dennis, thank you very much. Nicole, please. Uh, you know, I just have a, a couple of thoughts about these um, trenchant questions. I, I think, you know, our world is kind of going through convulsions, social convulsions, and it raises this really prime opportunity um, for peacemaking. And I, some people may look at that term and think, oh, it's pie in the sky. But I feel like the Comedia actually gives us the rigors involved in that activity. You know, right now um, in this country, we have the Black Lives Matter movement. We have um, incredibly serious conversations going on about the nature of the prison industrial complex and perhaps the George Floyd bill will be passing this month. Um, but, you know, I once heard a, a priest talk about our places of poverty mm -hmm. and I, every one of us has a place of poverty. Every one of our countries has a place of poverty and it's not always visible. Um, but you know, right now there's a lot of work being done around these underbellies that we have all experienced in some form or another, whether you're an immigrant to this country, whether you didn't come, whether your family hasn't come here by their own accord. Um, there's an author named Resma Menikim who looks at the lens of Black Lives Matter, that looks at the lens of making peace 
um, socially through the lens of trauma. And there's a woman named Heather McGee who looks at it through the lens of, of social policy in her book called The Sum of Us. And these writers really inspire me because they're looking at the whole. They're looking how racism hurts all of us. Um, and Dante, you know, France gets a lot of credit for the Statue of Liberty, but maybe Dante is really the guy to look to to liberate ourselves. You know, like maybe that's the contribution that nobody really has known about. <laughs> so, but I, I do have great faith in this in this poem and its potential. Um, and, and its ability to move people. I mean, Professor Looney, your work speaks so eloquently and meticulously to that fact, the history of how this, this book has been loved during times of great social strife. Yeah, Valerio, yeah. can I comment quickly? Absolutely, yes. Um, on, on this idea of hope that, uh, that Dennis brought up. It's always amazing to me that people who live in such brutal conditions read Dante's Inferno and they see the hope. They see that it's really a poem about hope. You know, one of the women can't find the quote now, but she, she, she said that. She said, well, I've been in a lot of circles of hell and I see that this poem is really about getting out of hell. It's not about you know being stuck and Dante does get out of hell. The men and women don't identify with the people who are stuck there forever. They get identify with, the, with Dante on his way out. And uh, one man who spent more than 40 years in prison. I worked with him after he came out and he was going back into prison to give hope to the men and women that he left behind. Uh, and when he read that line, uh, uh, abandon all hope, you who enter here, when we were reading Dante together, he said this, he said, I don't buy that. <laughs> Is Dante really saying that there's no hope? You can't enter a place like that. It would be suicide. Everyone carries hope with them when they enter a place deep within a person. He listens to what he's been told, but he don't believe that. He says, no, no, something good can come out of this. I'll make something positive out of this. So what Dante really tells us is this, even though the place you enter has no hope and says so on the door, you have to bring the hope in yourself. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, God wrote those words, as Dante tells it, of men and all hope ye who enter here, but Dante didn't buy it. I agree completely. Yeah. You know, um, he's he he's going to challenge it, and he challenges it in Paradise Nineteen in that Canto on Justice mm -hmm. more than in any other place where, um, you know, the he he says, "How is it just that a good man goes to hell?" He he challenges his culture's most important tenet about salvation. So you have to be baptized. You have to you have to be a Christian to go to heaven. He says, "Wait a minute." If there's a guy in India, and by the way, the guy in India is a person of color, or if there's a guy in Ethiopia, that's another example he gives, these are people of color on the margins of his world, the most marginalized kinds of peoples. He says, how is it just that we send them to hell? And they don't even, they haven't even heard anybody talk about Christ, right? This is pre-Jesuit missionaries and all of that. So, I mean, he, he goes big on his protest to the author of the line, Abandon All Hope, Ye He Enter Here. And I think when he hangs on to Virgil, I mean, there's something really precious about his relationship with his relationships. One is with Virgil, one is with Beatrice, one fleetingly is with St. Bernard. Um, you know, one very important one is with Mary and Jesus and God. That, 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 those bonds, and another word for it is his community saves him. And so, that's an important thing to take away and that you guys are taking the, the you guys are creating community through the reading of Dante that's very Dante-esque you know I want to say that's a positive Dante-esque thing you know that's what Dante wants and if I think back about history and thank you Nicole for saying these nice things about my book but in the 19th century there were all of these Dante reading clubs you know they're the famous ones with Longfellow but there are all these people gathering together. Some, sometimes they're Catholic, sometimes they're Protestant, sometimes they're women, sometimes they're all of the above. You know, they, it's a wonderful way to build a community around the reading of this specific text. This text Absolutely. with the word hope, I think we can say tonight, since we started with abandoned hope, we didn't tonight, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we didn't tonight at all and really is since 2011, I'm working on this topic, and tonight I think I really 
And please listen to in my words, all the voices of the audience that we got tonight, that I'm sure they want to share the thankfulness and for your insightful uh, talks and to have showing us that even if you close the book, you can open your imagination, your struggle for justice or just for yourself and so in your community. And so really this is something else and really the modern Dante. And we are all very grateful to you guys. Thank you so much once again. And obviously for uh, um, Consul Lorenzo Ortona and our host, the director of the Italian Cultural Institute, Anna Maria Di Giorgio, of which I turned the table to. Thank you, Anna Maria. Uh, thank you, Valerio. Thank you all once again for uh, this powerful, inspiring and touching presentation uh, from the bottom of my heart, really, and I mean it. Uh, and uh, thank you, Professor Pagano, Looney and Jenkins. Um, this video has been registered. It will be online soon on our YouTube channel and probably it will be also shown online on YouTube page for the next 24 hours because I've got people asking me if the video has been recorded. And uh, if you visit our YouTube channel, you will also find our previous program on Dante. So we hope you can enjoy all the web series on Dante we have been uh, developing. Uh, thanks once again to our Consul General Lorenzo Ortona for being here with us today. Thanks to my colleagues in North America. Thanks to our embassy in Washington. And um, so please, I hope you can follow our website, social network uh, and the social networks uh, um, and uh, newsletter to keep uh, up to date. Uh, and uh, so you, you won't miss uh, any chance to enjoy such a beautiful webinar as the one we enjoyed today. And please stay safe and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Have a very nice evening. Arrivederci. Buonasera. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie. Grazie a voi. Grazie a tutti. Grazie mille. A presto. Grazie. Grazie Valerio. Salve. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao Dennis. Ci vediamo presto. Ciao Nicole. Ciao Ron. <laughs>